Well, good morning, church. So, you know, it's one of the neat things about going through the Bible verse by verse, passage by passage, book by book, is that you don't get to choose what the topic is. And so last week, those of you who were here got to see some friends of ours surprise us from Kansas, and they needed some encouragement. And when you know it, the message is on the best is yet to come. Heaven. You know, for the believer, the best is yet to come. And so this week, you come on back, and you get a good spanking. (laughs) I didn't write Corinthians. This is the way the Lord led it. So anyway, it really isn't a spanking, but I just thought that was ironic. But we've already learned before that the church of Corinth was an unhealthy church, and it had problems with idolatry and sexual immorality and worldly wisdom and divisions and so many other things. And so Paul addresses these different things, and this morning he's going to address the church over the issue of divisions over different personalities. Divisions over different personalities. Casey Lewis said this about these divisions. Some in the church attach themselves to Paul, some to Apollo, some to Peter, and others to Christ. These factions, catch this, killed church unity and damaged their ability to accomplish their Christ-given mission unto the world. And and here's a newsflash, here's a surprise for you this morning, that churches today still divide over such things. Did you know that? I know, surely not. But churches divide over politics and how to do church and music and decor and so many other things. And I like this pastor, I don't like that pastor. James said this in James 4.1. Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? You lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. Keep that flowery opening in the back of your mind this morning as you open your Bibles with me, the 1 Corinthians chapter 3, as we continue in that verse-by-verse study. And again, last week, remember, though the world seems like it's falling apart, the best is yet to come. God has a plan for his kids. He has not left us as orphans, and our limited human mind cannot understand all that God has planned. And we said, no matter how much of this world you've seen and all of its beauty and all of its splendor, it's nothing compared to heaven. And I can't wait. And then we said that God's plan is revealed by his spirit. Paul said, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. So believers, we found out, are to have the mind of Christ, which then gives us godly wisdom, right? And and with that godly wisdom, We can look on suffering and the brevity of life and pandemics and all these other things and we could say, surely my God has a plan and surely my God has priorities. And when we have the mind of Christ, we can have the priorities of Christ rather than selfishness. And and so the Lord is going to take us to heaven. That was the promise. But what he says is the abundant, eternal life begins here. It's not in the great by and by. He promised us eternal life right now. And and so we can have that abundant life. And again, today we're going to learn that one of the major problems with the church at Corinth were these divisions. And, And Paul teaches that divisions, envy, and strife come from, catch this, carnality within people. And yes, even in believers. But we belong to Jesus, so it should not be. So if you have your sermon notes there on your chair, Roman numeral one, babes in Christ, babes in Christ. If your Bibles are open, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, look at verse 1. The Apostle Paul says, And I, brethren, could not speak to you as spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it, and even now you're still not able Wearsby said, Paul explained already previously that there were two kinds of people in the world, saved and unsaved, natural, and then those who are renewed in Christ. There in your notes. But now he explains that there's two kinds of saved people, mature and immature or carnal. 
Dr. Constable said, the Apostle Paul addressed these local church as believers because that is what they were. These were actually believers. They shared the life of God. The Holy Spirit lived in them, and they submitted to God somewhat. God commissioned them to take the gospel everywhere. And we need to keep these things in mind because if you look at their behavior, you would start to believe that they were not saved. You look from the outside and you'd say, these are not saved people, but Paul calls them Christians. And so you go, hmm, it's hard to believe that a saved person can behave so much like the world that you couldn't tell the difference. But Paul here says it happens. It actually happens. There in your notes, some believers are immature because they've only been saved for a short time. Others begin to backslide and still others neglect their relationship in Christ and they're not studying the word or praying. That's why I've always said when you look at a church body, you really have three people sitting in the chair. You have a sold out spirit filled believer. You have carnal Christians and you have non-believers all within the same church. And, and here's the problem within Christianity. This is a secret. Our diet matters. And I'm not just talking about the 20 pounds I've gained through COVID. <laughs> Our diet matters. Hebrews 5.12 says, For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. You have come to need, notice, you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. One commentator said milk represents what Jesus did on earth, while meat represents what he's doing in heaven right now as our great high priest. But in context, the writer of Hebrews was discussing right here Jesus' present priesthood in heaven. And there were so many people within the church that were too immature to catch what he was laying down. See, growth within Christianity, I've said this before, but this is such a truth. And, and it happens to the best of us. I would say it happens to all of us. In Christianity, there's only two directions. There's no middle. There's no neutral. You are either growing or you're backsliding. If you say, no, I'm just kind of taking a break and I'm comfortable right here in the middle, I got bad news for you. You're being fooled, you're backsliding. Imagine for a second that a six-year-old is walking around with a binky in his mouth, right? You would think, or at least I would think that one of two things, either that child has special needs and that's perfectly understandable, or those parents are doing a pretty lousy job not weaning that child off his binky. When that child turned 19 years old and shows up to college with a pacifier in his mouth, <laughs> what would you think of that? And, and so the writer of Hebrews says, by this time, by this time, you, you've been in Christ so long, by this time you ought to be teachers. But a lot of you can't even handle the elementary things. The NIV translates the word first principles as elementary truths of God's word all over again. In other words, these people had reverted. They had backslidden so much that they needed somebody to teach them the ABCs of the gospel all over again. In other words, they're a mile wide and about an inch deep Christians. Here's the key. Pay attention to this. It's not in your notes, but you ought to write it down. Truth heard, but not personally applied, will be lost by the hearers. Let me say that again. Truth heard, but not applied, will be lost by the hearer. And, and so the ability to share God's word comes with maturity. And, and these Christians understood that Jesus took the cross, and they understood all the other things, but they were just unable to retain the deep things of Christ. And, and again, imagine a 30-year-old walking into a church service with a baby bottle. How disgusting. And yet some in the church were refusing to grow up in the grace and knowledge of Christ. And again, for everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. In the Greek, he is a babe actually means 
he's again become a baby. In other words, he's reverted. He's gone backwards. Guzik said there's nothing more delightful than somebody who's brand new or a babe in Christ. And that's true. If you ever meet a baby in Christ, they're awesome to be around because they're so zealous, right? But there's nothing more irritating than someone who's behaving like a baby 20 years into their faith. Unskilled in the word of righteousness. There in your notes, Christians who go back to being babies are exposed because they are unskilled in the word of righteousness. Brand new Christians have to grow, no doubt about it. But those who have been Christians a long time should be skilled with the meat of the word. And so these Christians, they have a strong diet of the world and junk food theology. And they have not got skilled in the word of righteousness. And why? Roman numeral two there in your notes because they're still carnal. Look at verse three. The Apostle Paul, and by the way, if this message hurt, Paul wrote this, which didn't. (laughs) Verse 3 says, for you are still carnal. Why? For where there are envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? For when one says, I'm of Paul, and another says, I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? In other words, you're attaching yourself to men instead of to Christ. Are you not carnal? No one's perfect right? No one. But Christians should practice love and try to maintain unity with their brothers and sisters. Immature Christians love to fight and argue. Immature Christians love to cause strife wherever it is and over such minor things. I could see, you know, splitting over some major doctrine. But you have people who split over You know, it's too cold in the chapel. And others say it's too hot in the chapel. In the same service, I see people doing this and I see other people doing this. And and so I see people split over silly things like the air conditioner. And that should not be. There in your notes, but the problem with this church was having with favoritism among leadership revealed that there was actually something wrong in their individual relationships with God. These divisions were evidence of carnality within their lives, that they're relying more on the flesh than the spirit. Gordon Fee said, spiritual people are to walk in the spirit. If they do otherwise, they are worldly, and they're called upon to stop it. Remaining worldly for a Christian is not an option. Okay? The Christians in Corinth wanted to promote their favorite Bible teacher. And tell me this doesn't happen today. You know what John Calvin says? You know what Arminianus says? Right? You hear stuff like that. And don't get me wrong. If you're a mature believer, I love to sit down and talk about theology. I love it. I love to sit down and talk about eschatology. I love to to, to have that sort of stuff. But when you get these immature people who want to say, but John Calvin, can I tell you something? John Calvin was just a man. Okay? Arminianus was just a man. C.H. Spurgeon was just a man. Maybe good, godly men, sure. But they're just men. They're not Jesus Christ. And this should not be. If, if you study church history, and I took church history in Bible college, if you study church history, it is ugly. We do not have a pretty history. Go all the way back. It's not pretty. And those of you who have been in Bible college going, uh, yeah. The church divided so many times it was sickening and this group would break off of that group and that group would break off and and then you wonder why we have like 4,000 denominations. The Protestant Reformation started around 1517 and don't get me wrong, I think the Protestant Reformation was good, it just didn't reform enough. But many people broke off the Roman Catholic Church, formed these new denominations, then those denominations started to argue about, yeah, but how warm should the baptismal water be? But, but when should you take communion? Quarterly, weekly, monthly, once a year, never? And so they start breaking apart over all these different things. I want to talk about some of the telltale signs of an immature believer. Some of the telltale signs. And maybe you look at these and go, I got none of those, and praise God for you. Number one, there in your notes, immature believers lack of unity with other believers. The Apostle Paul to the church at Ephesus in Ephesians 4.11 said, And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, 
some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. So he gave gifted leaders. Why? Verse 12, for the equip, for we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. You are God's building. All through the Bible, you see gardening, right, as a term towards God's people. And the most notable one is the parable of the sower that Jesus said in Matthew chapter 13. Matthew 13, 3, Behold, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds came and devoured them. Some fell on the stony places where they did not have much earth. And catch this, they immediately sprang up. There's your zeal, because they had no depth. But when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among the thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked them out. But others fell on good ground and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. There in your notes. In the parable of the seed in Matthew 13, the message was the same each time. But there were four different types of soil, four different types of heart. So number one, the wayside was a well-traveled road or walking path. Now sometimes on... Like the wayside, you could see lettuce or chard or certain beans grow in that clay soil. But what Jesus is describing is something that's so hard, nothing could take root. And the birds came down and snatched the seed away. And by the way, most times in Scripture, when you see birds, they stand for evil. So most time, you know, when these birds came down, took the seed, no growth at all. Number two, the stony places. This had very shallow soil on top of a rocky underlayment. And again, you might get some plants to grow there, but usually ground cover or weed or some weeds or something like that. And, and so this stuff sprang up, sun comes out, they're gone. Number three, among thorns. This describes good soil that had a bramble bush, briar, or thorny plant around it. So there's nothing wrong with the soil necessarily, but the company it kept. You understand? Do not be deceived, my brethren. Number four, good ground. Describes fertile soil free from any weeds growing in it. A fruitful crop grows in the good ground. Now, there's plenty of farmers in our congregation, and I've known plenty of farmers, and no farmer would on purpose go and plant in some of these soils, right? I mean, why would they waste the time? Why would they waste the seed and the water and everything else? So think about this. The parable is about the kingdom of God. Jesus is the sower. And what's he sowing? The word of God. And what's the soil? Your heart. Your heart. What I've discovered is people come to faith from all kinds of different backgrounds. I mean, it's so neat when you see someone who was a drug addict come to faith, you know, and they got these huge testimonies. What's neat as well, though, is when you see a kid that was grown that was raised in a Christian home. They heard the gospel every day of their life, and all of a sudden, one day, in their self-righteousness, God smacks them in the chops, and they go, whoa, I'm a sinner that needs Jesus too. I had a good friend. She was probably morally the best person I ever met in my life, but she never realized that she needed the cross as bad as I did. But it's so neat to see people come from all different walks of life and come to faith and and they receive Christ, and they process things differently. However, the gospel is the gospel, right? We all need, for all have sinned and fallen short, right? There's none righteous, no, not one. The more I read Romans, the more I understand there's none righteous, and I think I'm involved with that none, and I think you are too. By the way, we're going to start Romans verse by verse, chapter by chapter in adult Sunday school on the 26th. At 845, that's, that's where we're going. So if you're interested in Romans, the probably the best book that describes the entire Bible in one book, the book of Romans, we're starting on the 26th. But Wearsby said, how did this image of the church as a field talk about the special problems that were in Corinth? To begin with, we must understand the emphasis must be on God and not the laborers. Hmm. Paul and Apollos were only servants who were doing their assigned task. It was God who gave life to their efforts. You've got to understand that. A farmer cannot make anything grow 
Sure, he can work the field. He can put the seed down, all the water, everything else, but it takes the gift of life to make that seed come to life. And you understand, when someone comes to faith, it's not like a one-time thing. You, they heard a message at Billy Graham Crusade, and they come to faith. That's not how it happened. What they didn't realize, and what a lot of us don't realize, is seeds were being planted for years. They had a grandma somewhere in her prayer closet. They've been praying for them forever. They, they had an aunt that told them about Jesus, someone that took them to Sunday school when they were little kids. Seeds were planted all through their life. And then all of a sudden they come and they hear a speaker one time, they give their life to Christ, and they go, man, that guy's such an evangelist. No, it's God who gives the increase. You understand? Seeds were planted forever. And that's why we can't worry about results. What we worry about is planting seeds. Hey, you might talk to somebody for 10 years and talk to them and talk to them and talk to them. They move away and they call you the next week and like, I just got to like Bartlesville, Oklahoma. I went and heard this preacher and I gave my life to the Lord. And you go, son of a gun. I talked to that guy for 10 years. <laughs> God gives the increase. It's the Lord who does it. And we got to understand that. There in your notes, 1 Corinthians 3, 6 teaches that no matter what job or ministry the Lord has given to individuals, all are equally important as the Lord allows us a part in fulfilling his purpose and plan. If he's called you to plant a seed, break out your hoe and plant a seed. You don't know what's going to happen. You don't know what that little seed is going to do. I still remember to this day there was a couple that, that took a liking to me and my sister who's just above me in age. We were little kids and my parents were pagans. And they asked my parents' permission to take us to church on Sundays and feed us lunch afterwards. And our parents were just in a big hurry to get rid of all those six kids. Take them all. <laughs> and so they, for, for a very long time, and I don't even remember how long it was, but we were little. And they took us down the street to Sunday school for so long and then took us home and fed us lunch and then dumped us back off. And this went on and on and on. Now, I didn't come to faith till I'm, you know, 15 and a half years old, right? Wrong. That seed was planted a long time ago. I was just stubborn, and God kept, you know, pushing and throwing me off the cliff, and finally I hit a brick wall, and I came to Christ. But the seed was planted by so many people, and I love to point to that because in children's ministry, we think, oh, this is the ministry I want. You know, up there means nothing. And let me tell you something. If God uses you to plant a seed in a little life, it's a big deal. It's a big deal. So many people think, like, that's important. This is not, no, that's not true. We're here for a purpose. And if God's called us to plant seeds up there, out there, at work, wherever, plant the seed, God gives the increase. And, and by the way, verse 8, not only are we unified in Christ for the work, but we will be individually rewarded. And we're going to talk about this more next week. But verse 8 again, now he who plants and he who waters are one, there's your unity, but each one individually will receive his reward according to his labor. We need to remember, Christian, we play for the same team, right? We have the same goal in mind. If we're truly sold out believers, we want what he wants. And by the way, since he sees tomorrow as it's happening today, he sees tomorrow. He says, hey, this is what I want you to do. I think his ideas are better than our ideas. So let's get practical, and again, next week, we're going to talk about rewards and judgments and all that thing, but, but here's the main thing. When I get to heaven, the only thing I long to hear is, well done, my good and faithful servant. That, that's all I long to hear. But David said in Psalms 133, 1, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. When a church follows God's plan, and God's structure, there'll be fruit, there'll be growth, there'll be unity and joy and all those things, and it will flourish. When we kick against the goads and want our own way, that's when the immaturity shows through and we're actually fighting against the Lord. Wearsby said, surely brethren should live together in love and harmony, harmony but often they do not. Think about biblical examples of this. I mean, it isn't like it's new to us. 
we're, we're like the apple off the tree, right? Think about Lot and, and how he fought to have the best cattle grazing land. Think about Absalom and how he caused a war for his father because he killed Amnon. And think about the disciples. I love the disciples. They walk with Jesus for three years, got to see his miracles, got to see all this stuff. And what's important to them? Tell me, Lord, who's the greatest in your kingdom? You know, you just think Jesus was a patient, patient man in the flesh, right? Because, I mean, I just want to, like, cauliflower their ears, you know. <laughs> You've seen all of this. You've seen how important everything is. And you come to me and you want to know who's most important? It is. But when we get so hyper-focused on non-essentials, we can ruin a fellowship. I mean, we just can. And the Corinthian church members were competing with each other, and they even at one point were suing each other in, in the court. And Paul's going to get to that and say, this just should not be. Wearsby says, the world watches these religious wars and says, behold how they hate one another. Think, think about that. The world outside says, behold how they hate one another. John 13, 35, by this, by what, John? All will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. And, and you see, when we live according to the flesh rather than the spirit, we actually grieve the spirit of God. And Paul gives the answer. In Galatians 5, 16, he says, I say then, walk in the spirit. And it will be impossible to fulfill the lust of the flesh. Walk in the spirit and you shall not, cannot. And, and so here's the thing. I have been crucified with Christ. Therefore, it's no longer I who live, but Christ Jesus lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. If that statement out of Galatians 2.20 is true, that I've been crucified with Christ. What crucified man, what right does a crucified man have? Do you understand that? What rights does a crucified man have? A and so if I truly have been crucified, if I'm truly dead to the world and alive in Christ, then unity means more to me than getting my own way. And I'm stubborn. I mean, I just got to tell you, I'm stubborn. But I find myself so many times saying that to myself. Galatians 2.20, I don't know that by heart by accident, right? <laughs> I know that verse by heart because I've had to recite it, recite it, recite it, and recite it some more to learn it. But let's talk about some things really quickly as we end. What gets in the way of unity within Christians? Number one, unforgiveness. The unwillingness to forgive hinders unity, and we're told very clearly, go to a Matthew 18 style. Go to them one-on-one, -on -one, two on one, then bring them before the church. That's how we do it. If you're unwilling to do it Matthew 18 style, but I don't want to talk to them one-on-one, -on -one, then it's a you problem. When our heart is so filled with the flesh, we, we cannot walk in the spirit. Next one is bitterness. When we allow unforgiveness to go so long, bitter root takes hold. And let me tell you, bitter root is such a strong plant in our hearts. We need to just root that thing up, throw it out, and, and forgive those people because that prevents unity. How about jealousy? When we're jealous of other people and what they have or how the Lord's blessed them and we let that stuff grow in us, think about the, the disunity that causes. And so James gives the sure cure, and this is where we're going to end. James tells us exactly what we need to do to get past this. You were hoping I'd end, right? James 4, 7, it's real easy. Therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and catch this. When you do that, he will lift you up. He will lift you up. As we come before a holy God and realize all the things that he has given us, it's humbling. It should be humbling to know that we deserve eternal punishment. We deserve all those things, and yet 
He's given us His love, His grace, His provision, His mercy. Called us His sons and daughters. And, and so what Paul and James says the same thing is, humble yourself and He will lift you up. Jesus lifts you up, but God resists the proud. Think about that statement. God resists the proud. Why are my prayers not being answered? Why is nothing going my way? God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Youch. The unmerited favor of God, his grace, will lift you up when you humble yourself. There in your notes, we are God's garden of grace since we belong to Jesus. We're fully redeemed, forgiven, and he wants us to live in community. And why? And we're going to get there in a few weeks. 1 Corinthians 6, 19, the rhetorical question. Well, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? Why? Because you were bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which both belong to God. As part of the body of Christ, you belong to him. And like any good parent, here's the bottom line. And I, I know this is kind of one of them tough messages talking about disunity within the body. But here's the thing. God is not the ogre waiting to slap you down. God is not the ogre keeping good gifts from you. God, like any good parent, think of you parents, think of it this as yourself. If I know what's good for my kid, and I know that what they're doing is the complete opposite of what's good for your kid, I'm going to do everything in my power to try and steer my kid away from that garbage. And God's the same way. He loves you. And he's saying, look, this stuff is going to harm you. This stuff is terrible for you. It's not that I want to control you or smack you down or be the big ogre in the sky. It's what you're doing is harming you, and I love you, so please stop it. And that's exactly what he's saying. Humble yourself, and he will lift you up. God resists the proud because he doesn't want you to go so far in your pride that all of a sudden you're just useless for the kingdom. God resists you because he wants you to wake up because God chastens those he loves. So how pleasant, how good it is for brothers, sisters in Christ to live in unity. And tell me that's not true. When there's, when there's a division within the church, oh man, let me tell you something. I could dwell on the smallest thing all week long and, and, and it, what I've done is I've removed Jesus off the throne and I've put this thing on it instead. And, and God's saying, no, 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 no. Dwell together in unity. Humble yourself. And he'll lift us up. I'm going to ask the worship team to come on back up. Every week we have some prayer partners in the back who'd love to pray with you. And this week's no different. I, I pray that as you go out that you didn't hear this message and think all of a sudden I'm a wretch and I'm all this. No, you're not. If you're in Christ, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And he loves you. He loves you and he wants what's best for you. And that's why he gives us those corrections. If he gave us messages like last week, every week, right? Candy and syrup every week. I love candy and syrup once in a while. But if that's all we had for our diet, man, we'd be a wreck. We just would. So let's pray. God, we thank you for your correction. And we thank you that you love us. And God, even if we've gone down that track of bitterness and unforgiveness and jealousies, God, you're so good. You will correct us and put us right back on the right path because you love us. You're not out to destroy us. You're out to give us a hope and a future because you love us. We're your kids. What else would you do? Any good parent would do that, and you love us. So, God, thank you for the corrections. Thank you for the reminders. Lord, and thank you that the best is yet to come. No matter how crazy this world seems, we know that heaven's coming, and you're coming back, and we can't wait. So God, bless us, encourage us, raise us up, and help us to worship you now because, Lord, who else is worthy of praise? You're so good to us. Thank you for all you do. In Jesus' name, and all God's kids said,